All right, countdown has ended. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Jay Duncan. I am a Palace Hope uh, Skyhope pilot, also on the board, and I am the chair of the safety committee. So uh, really uh, excited to have you all here tonight. Um, we're going to share some uh, some good news and some information about PALS. Also, uh, as back in popular, back by popular demand, we have uh, the controllers here to talk about um, their jobs and also answer your questions. So we're excited about that. Uh, we've got a lot of questions uh, for them to answer today. And then also, we have a, a raffle that we are going to have at the end of the program, right before we break out into uh, uh, breakout rooms uh, to, for each of the, uh, the controller groups. So uh, if you could, I mean, there should be a, a pop-up for you to enter your first and last name, and we will use those to draw from uh, for the prize. So if you can do that, that would be great. Give me a sec. All right. And I've got to clear mine because I I'm not eligible because I'm I'm an employee. Anyway, um, so with that, <laughs> uh, non-paid employee. Uh, our agenda for tonight is I'm sorry, I'm on my phone. I gotta get this seat. Hold on, I gotta get the, the phone out of the way. Thank you. Um, uh, so our agenda tonight is uh we just went through the welcome. We're gonna have some reminders, some exciting news. Again, our uh, ATC panelists. Uh, the the Q and A raffle and then the breakout rooms as I uh, I already kind of went through. So first thing that uh, seems to be a question that we keep getting about the call sign and we've covered this a couple times, but since it's since come up again, we are going to just uh, to cover that again for folks who uh, have any questions about it. Um, you can as a pals pilot use a uh, PLZ uh, call sign, and there is a unique number and call sign that you have. Uh, if you don't know what it is, you can go into your pilot profile online. You can also just ask if you can't find it. But uh, that is your unique code that you can use uh, to notify uh, ATC that it is a compassionate flight. They know by now. They've seen them a lot. They know us. Uh, and, you know, that could get you some uh, some expedited flight routes uh, and some other benefits possibly if it's uh, if it's allowed. So it does come in handy. Um, the only challenge is that your transponder must match uh, your pal's, pal's call sign. So if you are able to do it uh, in your in your plane, uh, also if you're a rental fleet, if you're part of a rental fleet uh, and you can do it um, as part of that, uh, that uh, equipment as well, uh, you can do it. Uh, if you don't know how to do it, you could ask. I know there's some planes and some types of transponders that will not allow it. So it's only if you can do it, and it's only for the patient carrying leg. You cannot use it on the, the other leg. You have to utilize your um, your tail number. So um, it's, uh, it's possible uh, in, in many cases. Uh, and then just a reminder, which often happens, you shut down to change it back to your tail sign um, after you've used it, especially if you're using a, a rental aircraft. Um, so I think that's uh, that's the general update on that. Um, if you have further questions, we can talk about that later, but um, that's, a, that's a quick. Uh, and, and just to let you know, we do get uh, reports if there's mismatches. So if you try to use that call sign, your um, transponder doesn't match it, uh, the other thing I meant, forgot to mention is that you can put that in your flight plan as well, um, and it should all match. Uh, so uh, use instead of using your tail number, you can use your call sign as long as it can be, you know, programmed into the transponder. All right. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Donna, who's going to take over next. Donna. I'd like to start off by thanking everybody for their support of Pal Skyhope. We're humbled, we're inspired, and we're awed by your dedication and commitment and compassion to our mission, so thank you. We are thrilled to announce that Tri Vilecci has been nominated for the 2025 Endeavor Awards. Uh, we submitted his name in recognition of his unwavering and unending support for PAL Skyhope. 
for patients and our veterans. And so please join me in thanking Shree for his leadership in uh, volunteer pilot flying. So thank you, Shree. Um, and my next slide is the pilot metrics slide. Um, like always, we like to keep everybody um, informed as to how we're doing and how we're growing year over year. I'll remind you that this data is comparing August to a full year of 2023. So we had 221 pilots apply to PAL Skyhope, and this is notable because we had 217 apply in the entire 12 months versus the eight months of August. Uh, through August, we had 196 unique pilots fly at least one flight versus 182 for the full year. And at the same time last year, we had 142. So we have 54 new pilots flying this year than last year. So that's awesome. So thank you. That means awareness, spreading the word. We appreciate all that. And then this is all amazing work. Um, and our volunteer pilots have flown 1,435 passengers uh, this year as well. So um, additional exciting news on slide seven is um, we have some great events coming up this uh, in the upcoming weeks and months. So on Saturday, September 20th, Am I on the right page? Yes, good. <laughs> on Saturday, September 21st at 10.30, we had the Smithsonian Air and Space Museum tour. There's still time to sign up. So if you're interested, please let Karen know. And also on Thursday, October 10th, we have our Westchester Gala at the Westchester Country Club. We have waived all the fees going into um, the Westchester um, HPN. Um, if you go into Millionaire. And a Friday morning, we have a breakfast, a pilot breakfast at the Westchester Country Club, should you be attending the event the night before and or if you'd like to fly in separately. Also, the fees will be waived and um, you get to have a Q&A with the board members. So that should be a lot of fun. So we hope you all can make it. And with that, I'd like to introduce Amanda, the A in our amazing uh, mission coordinators. Amanda. Hey everyone, thank you for having me. I wanted to take some time and introduce myself. If you don't know me, my name is Amanda Abanes. I have been with PALS for many years now. I'm sure I've corresponded and spoken with many of you over the phone, through email. Um, but I wanted to share some um, helpful tips uh, for pilots when they're trying to uh, select a flight. So it helps us, it helps the passengers and yourself, obviously. So uh, some things, if you see a flight you like, there are, there are so many out there that um, need us, they need our help. So if you see a flight you like, please remember that um, the airports can be changed, FBOs can be changed. Um, all you would have to do is either give us a call, send us an email, or you can just log on right to the pilot community, self-select the, the mission. And then in the notes, you can just write the change, whatever change you wanna make, whether it's airport or FBO. Um, speaking about self-selecting, self we mission coordinators would love for you to self-select. It actually helps us help more passengers. Um, so the, the difficult ones that maybe need a little more help in filling, we can make those calls to you guys. Um, also signing up early for flights, super, super important. Um, us mission coordinators like it and also gives the passengers the confidence that they have a pilot, that they know that they're gonna be able to get to and from their specialized treatment. So it's really important. Um, and we never, ever, ever want you to worry that, oh, I, I self-selected and now I'm committed. Whether it's a flight that's in a week, two weeks, or a month from now, it does not matter. If you have to come off that flight, you just give us a call, send us an email. We'll be more than happy to remove you. We understand life gets in the way. We totally get it. Um, also, contacting your passengers, super important. One to two days prior to flight date. So what happens is it gives also the passengers the confidence to, that they have, they spoke with their pilot, they know exactly where to be at what time. And for us coordinators, it actually helps us too because the day before the flight, we call 
each passenger. We make sure, hey, have you heard from your pilot? Yes, great, you know exactly where to be at what time, yes. And then we set them up with the ground transportation. So they're just little tips um, and definitely some recommendations to help us help them. So thank you so much. Um, if you should need any of us mission coordinators, we are just a phone call, an email away. You can contact us, the ABC team, Amanda, Courtney, and Barbara at any time. And if there's anything that we can do to make it a better experience volunteering, volunteering with Pal Sky Hope Better, just let us know. Thank you. And back to you, Jay. All right. Thanks, Amanda. You guys do a great job. We really appreciate it and love Thank to hear you. from you. Thank um, you. <clears throat> All right, next we are going to go to our uh, special guests. And that includes Sam, John, Kevin, Joe, Andrew, and Stephen, uh, who are our, our ATC staff. And they are going to, I think they're going to introduce themselves quickly. And then we're going to go into the questions that you have uh, previously asked. And then we'll also open it up for other questions uh, that you may have uh, that you thought of while you were on the call. Let me start with Sam. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Ramos. I'm an air traffic controller now for the past 14 years. And currently, I am a operations supervisor at the Philadelphia TRACON Area C, which many of you may know as the Newark area from the New York TRACON. Uh, based on the questions that were asked, I'm pretty sure you guys know what I'm talking about. So uh, I want to thank you guys as pilots uh, for what you do and all the mission assistance. Also, um, I had the chance to do both um, when I'm not working, obviously. Um, and I, I the, the passengers, it was pretty cool to see how much they appreciate everything you guys do. So we're here to answer anything. You know, as controllers, we have tough skin. So there's no question that's too difficult uh, to answer. And uh, I look to have a good time, like always. Thanks, Sam. John? Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Cavino, uh, and I am a former air traffic controller from Boston Tower. I just recently retired. Um, I did air traffic control for 35 years. Uh, I'm still in the system, though. I am currently an instructor uh, for the FAA. I work in our uh, tower simulators, and I teach the controllers at both Logan and uh, Bedford Hanscom on the, uh, the techniques and the uh, rules and regulations of ATC, so I, I still keep my hand in it, and uh, I still fly and uh, try and do some missions when I can. And I'm um, looking forward to uh, answering anybody's questions this evening. It's good to see some familiar names on the program tonight, and uh, I'm looking to the uh, forward to the breakout sessions later. Well, it's great to hear. From, uh, the, the, I didn't realize you guys both did, so that's awesome. Uh, Kevin. Hello, Kevin Plant here uh, from Boston Approach Control, Boston Tracon. Um, also a pilot coming to you guys really as a fellow pilot tonight. Just happen to have some specialized experience. Don't represent the uh, FAA in any official way, but happy to answer any questions as uh, fully as I can to help any of you guys out as much as I can. Awesome. Thank you, Joe. Uh, hey, uh, Joseph Mash. I've been at uh, Potomac for 18 years. Uh, that was my first facility. Um, I've been a pilot for about 22 years. Um, I recently got into some King Air charter pilot stuff um, in my when I'm not working six day work weeks. I do that for my day on my days off. Um, also do some uh, pilots and Paul stuff. Um, but yeah, I'm here to answer any questions. Hope you guys uh, enjoy. Thanks, uh, Drew. <clears throat> Hey, uh, I'm Drew Buckman. I uh, started out uh, nearly 20 years ago at Memphis Center, uh, and I've been at Atlanta Tower for about the last 14 years now. So uh, I may or may not be able to answer any center questions for you, um, but I can definitely work on some of the tower stuff. But prior to being invited to, to come and, and be part of this, I had no idea what this uh, what PALS was. So I got to look it up. I've been kind of looking into it. And, and while I have to say I don't think I've seen the PALS call sign in Atlanta, uh, I'm, I'm just happy that uh, you consider inviting me on here uh, to be a part of this. So uh, it's a busy airport in Atlanta, so I'm sure many of you have flown in and out of Atlanta. So I'll be here to answer what I can. Thanks. 
We might get the question about uh, that collision that happened the other day. <laughs> I am, I am, I'm actually in Las Vegas right now at our CFS for communicating for safety. And, and if I had a dollar for everybody that brought that up, I would gamble for free the entire week. <laughs> all right maybe we won't ask it <laughs> it's okay Neither. you know if you can't if you can't <laughs> laugh about it now then you're in the wrong spot yeah oh all right steven uh, i'm steven um i'm a controller i've been there uh since 21 but my first facility was fayetteville north carolina um i'm also a commercial pilot and a plane owner uh, I've, I've also never heard the call sign pals but eager to learn um and uh i fly obviously around this the Potomac area, so I'm familiar with that, and uh, yeah, just excited to be here. Awesome, thank you so much. Since I'm the host, I'm going to brag about something quickly. This isn't on the program, but today I did uh, 22 landings, 10 uh, land, and and 12 uh, water landings. I'm getting uh, checked out in my friend's uh, Lake Amphibian. So once I get that next week, if anybody's around and wants to meet me in Keene for a little splash, you're welcome to. Um, all right, so we're going to jump right into the questions. Um, thanks for everybody who submitted them. Uh, let's see. Uh, first, maybe we'll start with Sam. There's a really interesting one. This is very specific. On the sectional chart, the blue zippered line south of Long Island, the East Coast Atlantic low control area, uh, what are the requirements to fly, fly below and above the stated altitudes? It's sign, at times, especially in the summer, we may have to conduct search and rescue operations there for the Coast Guard. Okay, that's interesting. Well, I tried to look this up. We actually don't, uh, in our facility, don't control that area. Um, as far as I'm concerned, it's not restricted um, when I was looking at it. But uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find a straight answer on it. <laughs> so... Um, I, I did try to find one, but no one seemed to know. Uh, I'm unsure, honestly, if it's uh, controlled by the center that far out. I don't know um, if any of the other controllers have any more insight to it, but we don't control that far out. So it's hard for me to say ac in with accuracy what exactly is required, if anything is required at all. Okay. Well, that's just so when you see that on the sectional chart that's the floor of controlled airspace so that's the difference between e and g airspace and um any minimum vectoring altitudes that atc has to work with will be at least a couple hundred feet above those numbers that you see thanks thanks for that um all right so this would be maybe for uh drew or joe um how do air traffic controllers balance safety and efficiency increasingly crowded air space um, and what technology technological advancements could further enhance our ability to manage air traffic I know you've got a uh, you know antiquated system in some cases but it's getting better do you have any uh, specific information on that front uh, I can speak for Atlanta on that um, we there is one way uh, essentially it's kind of like in the northeast there's one way in and there's one way out of Atlanta if you're going to come in from the northeast you're going to land on this particular one with that particular runway um and we also break it down very heavily there's one controller that does a b c and d and there's a controller for each one of those legs so we can divide our tower up into five different local controls meaning we can have five different tower controllers in there for each runway that we that we use um a, a lot of common question that we get a lot of times and if you've flown into the atlanta area uh we have the the prm frequencies um and, and a lot of people get confused by that but that's another controller that's separate from the tower that's down in uh at the tracon uh to help manage that so we we we, we i don't want to say we, we we really break it down and and you're going to talk to a lot of controllers along the way and there's a lot of controllers involved to help to minimize that as far as technology and everything goes um yeah, we're working with FAs and decoded and the technology. Um, we're fortunate to be in Atlanta and a lot of the, all these other airports controllers that are on here. We all deal. Uh, we use the ASDX, and so uh, when you see some of the reports in the news of, of near collisions on the runways, all, at least that technology for the larger facilities, and we're fortunate to have will we'll prevent things from from that happening. But there's just a lot of to be brief or to, to sum it up, I should say there's a lot of controllers involved to to help manage all of the airplanes that we have in the airspace so we we break it up as much as we can 
This is a one related to this could be for anybody related to our um, our call sign, um, and uh, in terms of. Uh, I think last call we we heard that maybe on the Tracon you don't get the tape printed out. Where would if you put the remarks in your in your uh, uh, in your uh, flight plan? Um, so you may or may not know it's a PALS flight. So does that do, do I know some of you haven't seen it before, but um, do you if you don't recognize the call sign, do you see the remarks and do the remarks help uh, if you wanted to put anything special in there? I think it uh, came up the last time that we had this, and yes, you can do that, um, but many facilities are paperless, so uh, they won't see that flight progress trip. Um, what a lot of controllers do when they're when they're unfamiliar with a route or unsure of a call sign, we will request this the, what's called the flight progress trip from the uh, information machine, and then we'll see the entire flight plan, and we'll see the remarks, and we'll go, oh, okay, or we'll just ask you. I mean, usually we'll just ask. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, this is for um, uh, John or Kevin. Uh, we have, actually, we're starting to get a few more flights into Boston. Usually we try to bring them into Bedford primarily in the area. Uh, but, you know, that can be sometimes pretty intimidating, especially for GA. Any, uh, any recommendations in general for arrivals and departures um, into Boston? That might be helpful for folks to maybe demystify or you know not make it so um, nerve wracking. Um, I'll let Kevin take the uh, the arrival portion just to keep up with the traffic inbound uh, and the tracon, and then I can uh, you know add some stuff uh, when I get into the terminal environment uh, local with the tower on uh, our frequencies. But uh, Kevin, do you want to go ahead? Sure. I mean, I think the the best thing you can do. Um, high level at least coming in is being ahead of the airplane. And we can hear that sometimes from some pilots coming in where you can just tell they're behind the airplane and boy, that's not a spot you wanna be going into a really busy airport. So I would say being ahead of the airplane is a big one. Um, another one is be able to fly the speed that you say you're gonna fly. So when we are gonna put you on final and we're gonna sequence you with uh, faster traffic, if you're going to do 110 knots, okay, we can work with that, but just tell us what the best you can do is and then reliably fly that speed. Those are probably the two big ones. And for the control tower, if uh, like the last point that Kevin just made, uh, if you give them an assumption of what speed you're going to do and it doesn't materialize when you're on final, then the tower has to really get you off the runway in a quick, very fast time. Um, so my recommendation to all pilots landing is uh, A, study the airport layout prior, uh, do your homework. Um, there's many taxiways. I'm not saying memorize every taxiway, but uh, you know, ask for progressive taxi on arrival. Uh, when you are landing on, on a certain runway, uh, plan for a turn a turnoff that's at least midfield. So keep the airplane in, in the air, you know, fly down the runway, similar to what you do at a Sun and Fun or an Oshkosh, where the controller tells you to keep it you know, to the next dot. We don't want you to land on the numbers and just, you know, go kaput and, and have to taxi down for another minute. There is airliners, you know, literally two miles in trail of you waiting for you to exit the runway. So just know your good exit. I would say midfield, keep a good head of steam down the runway, you know, safely put it down when, when the speed's right. And then uh, plan your first available turnoff and get off the runway so the trade con can resume arrivals behind you. Uh, that's probably my biggest uh recommendation to build on that i would say that goes doubly at night when you're coming in at night it's a lot harder to recognize which turn off is which and so if you've studied the taxiway diagram in advance and you have an idea of where you think you'll probably be turning off the runway um, that helps to have that awareness in your head before you're trying to find the turn off in a sea of lights on the airport yeah, actually um i was going to ask the kind of the question that uh you got to John, but um, so uh, since most of the uh, we're all going to signature way down at the end, and is it is it is it worse to like stay your slow to go much much farther down, or just like plan for halfway down the runway and then turning off? 
So usually if the configurations at Logan, if we're landing on the fours or if we're landing on the two twos, the big runway in the middle, three, three left, that's a good midpoint that you can plan to vacate on. When we're on those configurations, we really don't use that runway for anything but a long runway departure occasionally. So if you're landing two, two right, the Tracon will sometimes give us two, two right with the small, smaller single engines uh, just to get them in and there's no other arrivals behind you, that's optimum for us. We'll take the Palace flight on 2-2 right. This way, there's no other traffic to worry about behind you, you know, overtaking. Um, but if you did land, say, runway 2-2 left, then the midfield turnoff on that big runway, it's easy to find. You, know, you vacate there, and that's a straight shot. We can get you right to signature with least amount of turns. We'll keep you on that runway. Last taxiway on the left is Lima and you're looking right at the signature van. So we try and keep it as simple as possible for you. And conversely, if we're landing four left or right, you're, I'd say 90% of the time you will be landing four left if it's good weather. Um, and the same thing, just keep it rolling down four left uh, till uh, three, three left definitely helps us in that configuration as a turnoff as well. If you do take an early taxiway, when you land from runway four left, you're kind of going up against the grain with all the departures that are making their way out towards our main departure runway, which is runway nine on that configuration. So keep it in the air, four left down the midfield. That's a great turnoff spot. Great, thanks. All right, this one's for Sam. Uh, somebody asked what the best low, uh, low altitude single engine piston altitude is for uh, between New York City and DC if you're on IFR. Wait, uh, say that one more time. Uh, best low altitude to file uh, IFR between New York City and DC. Uh, it really depends on what airport you're going to. Um, there are a lot of low level tech routes. Um, if you file uh, basically what's in the AFD or now called the chart supplement, um, you should more than likely get those that route. There's really I wouldn't guess at a route. I would use what's in the tech route. Um, we in our area we're so we're busy enough that we really don't aren't able to coordinate with other facilities because of the lack of airspace we have to change the route for you. So we just file the tech out of our airspace and then we always advise you in the air. We know that some of the techs are antiquated, so we tell you, you know, make the request with the next facility. They have a little bit more space and it's easier for them to you know, cut, shortcut you. That happens a lot going uh, southwestbound over Romsville or um, over Yardley. Um, you know, sometimes a lot of the routes take you over Solberg, which is which is actually pictured right here in my in my in my background. Um, you can actually get a shortcut from before Solberg, but it depends on what you want. So you just have to ask. Um, we generally don't shortcut unless it uh, gets us helps us out or you ask for it. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I think so. Thanks. Um, maybe on this one, because we've heard uh, on other calls from, from other uh, other folks who are uh, repeat uh, attendees, uh, maybe or Drew or Joe. Um, things that pilots do uh, that make your job more difficult. So maybe some uh, things that we hear, we maybe we can try to not to do that, those things. Who's ready to pull an old nighter? <laughs> keep it short and nice <laughs> just kidding uh I, th I think i had one the other day um someone who tries to like lead me like asking me hey do i need to change frequencies am i still so you know it's if you've been sitting in silence for a few miles that's one thing but like if i'm constantly talking to someone else or another other pilots and other airplanes and you chirp in just ask me if i'm still if you're still supposed to be with me or Something like that, you know, it's kind of like, you know, read the room kind of, I, I didn't forget about you, you know, it's, that's one of the things that kind of got me the other day is like somebody kept chirping at me about a frequency change and they're like in the middle of my airspace. Um, that was kind of distracting and um, it was, I was stepping on some other people that was trying to check in that had uh, some, you know, more important things that I needed to do with this airplane that I kept getting stepped on by someone else asking me um, about, about themselves. So just remember, you know, you're, it's a big sky. There's a lot of other people out there than just you. 
and as a pilot before I was a controller, it, it's it's hard to remember that. It's hard to remember that you're part of a system with a lot of other airplanes out there. So, um, it's easy to get sucked into just being in the cockpit and forgetting that it's just not you out there. But that would be my one recommendation. Just remember you're part of the system. You're part of something larger and bigger. And it's not it's not just, you know, not just you out there. Coming from, um, yeah, coming from, I would say from the, from the larger airport side of things is, is, uh, number one, uh, listen, uh, when, when we have to reach out to the pilots multiple times to, to get a read back or a tax instruction or anything of that nature, and no one answers, it's, it, uh, it, it puts us behind because at larger airports, we do tend to have, um, lots of, I mean, there's just a lot of airplanes. And so whenever you're available or when you're not available, then it, uh, it, uh, it, it makes it harder for us on that. Um, number two, be ready to go because nine times out of 10, there's always another airplane that's waiting to depart or somebody waiting uh, for you. Uh, just be ready. If you have questions, don't hesitate to ask, at least in Atlanta, if you're going to do it, uh, maybe even ask the questions before you leave the ramp so that we know that uh, we can get you headed in the right direction. Uh, be ready to go. And then if I can tag on to what John was saying a little while ago, uh, I've seen the things on uh, line and I've seen the, 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 the memes and things of people saying, oh, this controller's having a bad day. If you're exiting the runway and there's an airplane that's two miles in trail of you and I need you to get off, it's not that we're having a bad day. We're not being mean. We're not doing anything. It is literally to keep the aircraft from from going around behind you. Uh, and, and we understand that a lot of times that when you're coming in GA and you're looking for signature and you don't really know where to turn off the runway, that we will guide you in that direction. Um, but I need you just to just to listen, hustle up. We're not mean people. We're really, we're not. We're just trying to make sure that everybody that's on final gets on the ground safely and we can keep you moving. Thanks. For me, it's checking in. For the love of God, stop blocking us when we're just to check in to tell me you're with me we know you're with you let's let me give you a little insight to the big picture when you're with one control facility and they switch you to another control facility once you're airborne tower and, and um tower to departure or approach to tower is a little bit different but approach to approach right remember if you're not given a radar service terminates for further fly following contact such and such that means that when they give you a frequency change the control has been transferred of your airplane to another controller. That means we see you. We know what altitude you're at. We know where you're going. We have your type. We have all your information. We know how many people on board, your dog's with you, everything. We know it already. So when you check in, if you hear the frequencies busy, just be patient. Yes, you're supposed to check in, but you don't have to check in right away. I can't tell you how many times we're doing this. Approach clearance after approach clearance after approach clearance, and they're going block, block, block. And then I know what it is. It's someone checking in. And now I'm not just a, I'm not just talking to the GAs. There are my private jet pilots out there. The airliners do it too. I will say they're all no one's immune to it. They're all doing it. We're just requesting that people be just a little bit more patient, especially in the bigger facilities, like uh, Drew was saying. Uh, you know, just wait a couple of extra seconds. Trust me, we see you. And if we're busy and we need to get to you, you'll come up. We'll reach out to you. And I've had that happen many times. Um, and it happens on a daily occurrence. So that's that's one peeve that controllers, I tell you, cannot stand. Because remember, we're talking minute after a second after second, right? We're already two steps ahead on the instructions we have to give. So we give an instruction. You block us. We have to repeat it. And now we're already backed up one instruction. So, you know, we, it, the chain backs up really quick in a busy facility. So... It's not that we don't want to talk to you or we don't want to hear you. We see you. Just be patient. I promise you we'll get to you. <laughs> so, Sam, what is the most brief uh, way to check in? I mean, instead of giving us all this, this information, what do you want to hear from us uh, when we do check in? Really, for example, November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5,500. Done. Yep. Not, you don't even have to say with you. It's not a conversation. Just say, you know, November 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5,500. We know Perfect. where you're going. Or if the instruct the previous controller tells you to tell me something like we're on an assigned heading, you can say that five. I'm with uh, November one two three four five five thousand five hundred assigned heading zero nine zero. Looking for on course. Simple, straight to the point. We know what you need. We know it, and then we'll say Roger or proceed on course, whatever. And this one for everybody, uh, just maybe a reminder um, of what we really need to say back to you. Obviously, a Bravo clearance. 
um, you know, what, what works with Wilco, what works, what, what, what do you absolutely need to hear from us so that we don't say more than we have to, or we say what we need to, to you. Hold short instructions. That's the big one. Mm -hmm. And I, I think a big thing also, is if, uh, if you're not used to filing IFR or, or not necessarily IFR, but out of a big airport with a SID, a lot of guys miss the SID and the magic word transition and we're going 15 times trying to get you said the word transition and you know so just knowing for a, a you know just a clearance the clearance limit the altitude and it just say it exactly how i said it and it'll always and, and the initial altitude usually unless it's a climb v or something like that yeah and, and steve knows too a lot of these sids now have your initial departure frequency on there and nine times mm -hmm. out of ten you can tell someone who doesn't brief the SIDS when they're coming out of the airports because they get the wrong frequency or they have to go back to the tower and ask again, hey, what's that frequency? So usually frequencies are on that SID, so just brief those. And I added, uh, since Sam already had a nice uh, weather picture, I added some flight strips here. So a lot of you guys may not get to see stuff like this, but your remarks would go like right here in this section here. And unless yes. it's a long sentence we get to see most of it so this you know like sam said not everybody gets strips anymore but if if you do um that's what it's gonna look like and here's the remarks right here so like somebody would put wml is marlin so like if you were to put plz is palace hope that's where that would go right there for an example awesome thank you anybody else any other comments Uh, one thing I ran into the other day, just a reminder, is uh, coming in at night sometimes when, you know, it's a pallet controlled lighting airport. Um, you know, you're taught a lot of times that it's just the CTAF, um, but some airports, since there are many airports in one area with the same frequency, and the notes, it might have a different uh, frequency for pilot controlled lighting uh, at night. So just uh, maybe check, double check that if you're going into a place that you don't know what it is, because if you're trying to light up the runway at night and you don't have the right frequency, it's a little bit of a problem. So hopefully that's helpful. Um, along the lines of uh, um, what you have to tell people, are you okay with uh, people abbreviating the, say, 2,500 to 2.5? So climbing from 2.5 to 5.5 versus, I mean, you get you get it. Is that okay to do things like that? or? Or do you want to hear? Well, pilots aren't assigned any specific phraseology. Only we are. So we have to say it a certain way. But if you read it like that, you know, depending on the person, you, it may annoy them. But you're not doing anything illegal by doing that. So I don't have any problem with it at all. I, I don't care good. either way. I know what you mean. If it stops you from talking faster, it's good for me. Yeah. My phraseology I mean, works different when I'm in the cockpit. Uh, what was that? That my phraseology when I'm in the cockpit is different than when I'm at work. Well, All I will right. say the only thing, really, from a tower, <laughs> that's true, but from a tower perspective, um, the only thing, the only thing I ever need to hear from you is hold short of runway two six left. I need the whole thing. We right. get it a, a lot of times. We go, okay, we'll cross the right, hold short of the left. That is the only. That is the only bit of phraseology that I have to hear all the time and i know what you meant i know exactly what you're going to do um now if you say you know or we're departing here we're climbing to 10 instead of 10,000, that's fine but it's the runway hold short instruction that i have to hear hold short of runway two six left two seven right whatever it may be but that is the only thing that i have to hear anything else that I, I don't care if you abbreviated it i just want to hear that you got it the other thing about the um the read back of any instruction is probably the most important thing that has to be included is your call sign. If, if you don't use your call sign, there are certain times where it's an instruction or an advisory or whatever, where it's not really a big deal. Okay. We don't actually have to check a box here. Um, so that you didn't use your call sign isn't the end of the world, but there's sometimes where uh, visual separation is a big one for us. If, if you're saying that you're going to maintain visual separation from somebody and you don't use your call sign, then for our purposes on the ATC side, it doesn't count. And then we have a loss of separation as a result of you not using your call sign. So if at the very minimum, if all you do is acknowledge with your call sign, then 
we can check the box and press on. Yeah, to piggyback yeah. on that real quick, uh, just to give you the pilots an idea of what we have to deal with, we're held to account based on what we say. It's all recorded. And if God forbid something happens, an incident or a runway incursion or anything, all those things are played back. And what we say is what we are judged on. So if you go, if we give you an instruction such as a whole short and you don't read that runway back and we just let it go, and we say, oh, I know what he meant, like Drew said, and, and then God forbid something happens, the first thing they're going to say to Drew is, well, why didn't you correct the read back? Why didn't you get the runway? You're supposed to do that as a controller. So believe it or not, we may get on your case, and it's not because we feel like it. It's because it's a safety issue, and we will be held liable or to account for that error. Um, and along those lines, in terms of call signs, um, I assume, I mean, I think this is well known, but you can confirm it or not, that we shouldn't shorten it unless you do. So we say our whole call sign, but if you say, you know, nine one Romeo instead of the whole thing, then we can repeat that back. Or is that um, just so there's no confusion? I know you probably Actually, do vice it. versa. So if you shorten it, we can say it how you say it. But hmm. we have to say it correctly the first time. And if you say you know, like a lot of guys, you know, three numbers in a row, they always say triple four or whatever, mm -hmm. whatever it might be. Then we can say it. Hmm. Um, but we're not the phraseology police. I mean, as okay. long as the big ones are the hold shorts and clearance limits, stuff like that, altitude assignments. Other than that, if you say 2.5, I don't, unless they're having a bad day, they're not going to care. All right. Uh, this one, I think, is specific to Sam. Uh, somebody asks, how have things changed with the new, with the N9, November 90, uh, I guess it's Newark, moved to Philly? <laughs> you know what that means. I know, yes, I, I think everyone knows what it means. It's been on the news, it's been everywhere. Um, it's a talk of the ATC world, of the aviation world. I, I cannot speak to the specifics of the details of it. Obviously, I'm still an FAA employee. I'm not speaking as an FAA employee. I'm speaking as a pilot myself. However, I can, the things I can tell you are the things you already know, that the airspace, the control of the airspace was transferred to another facility, uh, to Philadelphia TRACON. The airspace itself has not changed. None of the frequencies have changed. And as a matter of fact, none of the controllers have changed. It's the same voices. We were just picked up and moved from one place to another, and we're controlling it to another in another area. Uh, and just like many facilities, almost all throughout the NAS, we're dealing with staffing issues. So um, there's also uh, the uh, portion of the human factors, uh, the human element. We're dealing with people that are set in their ways and that don't like change. Most of us don't like change. Um, so there's a lot going on, but the, most of the, most of the controllers really do a good job and they're still trying to do their best to help you guys out. Uh, and we still do the job every day. So other than, you know, you may have a, a controller who's a little shorter than normal. Um, we're still doing everything exactly the same. So it hasn't affected, you know, the routes, the service, anything. Uh, there are times where we're shorter staffed than other nights. So sometimes we'll, not give VFR fly following due to, you know, due to a controller workload. But other than that, you know, your regular services shouldn't have changed a bit. At least not that I've noticed, and I'm there six days a week. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, general question about uh, emergencies, how you handle them, and are there different levels? Do you make an assessment of if somebody does uh, – declare an emergency of, and, and, you know, depending on what it is, uh, or is there, you know, a procedure that they automatically have to be given priority right away? How does that, how does that work for you guys? I think it depends on the emergency and what's going on with the situation. Um, there are some emergencies where uh, the nature of the emergency is such that you need to get on the ground immediately and there's other emergencies where it's okay i need to go find a piece of the sky that i can just call mine for a little bit and fly around run some checklists make some calls figure things out um and it, it all depends so a lot of that as a controller we're going to be asking for the pilot what it is that they need from us 
And sometimes it's, I need you to just leave me alone for a little while so I can run some checklists and figure things out. Other times it's uh, a pilot wants ATC to be a resource and uh, offer some assistance. But as controllers, we can't help if we don't know what it is that your issue is or how we can help. Like, like Kevin said, when there's an inbound emergency uh, in the airspace working things out, maybe they're holding or circling to burn some gas. Uh, when they do head back, we're coordinating back and forth between our facilities. And uh, at Boston Logan, you get special treatment. You get your own frequency. You get your own dedicated controller uh, who gets that frequency. Uh, the reason we do that is we split the frequency so fire command and the fire trucks mass port on the field can talk directly to the pilots and you're not competing on that frequency with other aircraft. So Kevin will hand it off to the tower, seven, eight miles out. It'll be on a discrete frequency. The uh, emergency vehicles will be on that same frequency in case you need to relay anything immediately. And uh, we have your own special controller that, that'll take care of you all the way to signature, so. Awesome, thank you. This is for uh, maybe Kevin or John. Um, the specific question status of ILF 15R transition to visual 4L L, uh, in Boston. Well, so that went away. It's probably been a couple of years now. Um, there was an incident with a Pilatus um, where uh, it, this was a, uh, well, I'm not going to name the operator because uh, I'm going to protect the guilty on this one, <laughs> but they were flying the ILS. One five right transition to a visual four left, and they messed it up about as horribly as you could possibly imagine. Where when they were in the visual transition to four left, they made a right turn and they flew up the four right final, where there were a whole bunch of airplanes on the four right final. And that was one of the uglier situations I've seen on a radar replay. So there was a separation loss between this PC-12 and multiple airplanes on the four right final. Um, following that incident, the incident was reviewed through all the way up the chain on the air traffic side, as well as all the way up the chain on the FISDO side. And basically senior leadership on both sides wanted to completely shut down the procedure and say, we're never doing this again, it's too dangerous. Um, so for a short time, we didn't do it at all. And then it has been started back up in a very limited way. So at this point, the only operator that is flying that procedure is Cape Air. Um, so when we have the weather for it, Cape Air will fly it. There is an effort between the facilities to try to get um, maybe a couple of more operators on board. But at this point, we're looking at like 135s, 91Ks, um, not so much the individual straight 91 operator. So I would say that as a PALS pilot, you should pretty much expect that you're not going to fly that procedure anytime soon. As uh, will it ever open back up to more people to fly? Maybe, I wouldn't rule anything out, but I would not expect anything to happen that way anytime soon. All right, thank you. Um, and Mark had a question about uh, the TRACON phone number for early morning departures is not working in Norwood for a few days. Uh, if that something like that happens, uh, is there alternate numbers or other ways to get a load of uh, TRACON and get the information you need? I, I just I just texted Mark the uh, oh. recorded uh, the the number for them. Yeah. Oh, that that one didn't work. Kevin, the uh, recorded line is not working, the 594. Yeah, that's a problem. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's the same problem we have if, uh, you know, say we need to call the facility for some reason as an employee that works there, um, oh. it, it just doesn't work. And so, yeah, that's been a problem at Boston Approach intermittently for a while. And I unfortunately don't have a good answer for a workaround. Um, maybe you could call, if you need to get a hold of somebody, I would say if you call the Boston Center flight data phone number, 
they can give us a call on a direct line that is outside of the commercial phone line network. Uh, so they would be able to relay whatever you need. Thank you. Uh, question about 121, the emergency frequency 1.5. Like who is that monitored by the different uh, controllers in each region or each each uh, airspace? Uh, or is who 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 monitors that? Um, if you ever need it, everybody. Every every HC facility in the country. Okay. All right. So this is for. Um, I think Sam, very specific one in the Teterboro, Rudy uh, a six Sid is reported to have the most pilot deviations of any procedure in the FAA system, uh, impacting single pilot IFR and professional flight crews and car uh, basically everybody. What's right. the FAA's take on this? Is anything being done to improve that? Well, uh, this one, uh, I, I'm glad this question came up. It makes me feel good because we saw, we, oh, I believe we have solved this issue. Uh, I worked over the past two years because of those brasher warnings we were giving off Teterboro. Uh, I worked with a, a challenger pilot friend of mine that I've known for many years that has flown out of Teterboro. And I said, you know, what can we do to stop these guys? For those that don't know really briefly, the Teterboro, uh, the Rudy Six departure is very complicated, Sid. It is designed to protect the uh, aircraft departing off of Teterboro from the Newark arrival, which is using the Teterboro VOR. Now it's a GPS fix, but as a initial uh, approach fix. So it's altitude stop here and altitude stop at Newark so that you guys crisscross without uh, getting too close to each other. What was happening is pilots were busting that altitude every time. The reason for that was on the departure SID itself, the, the Rudy 6, in the upper right-hand corner, there was a top altitude box. It said 2,000 in it. So I, I, I couldn't figure out for the life of me why they were missing this crossing restriction with the two bars at, at Wentz. So my pilot buddy says, well, I'll tell you exactly why this is happening. Most pilots do not fly VNAV departures. Now we're talking about jets and advanced aircraft. They fly lateral. Only on arrival do they fly the VNAV and let the autopilot step the airplane down. On departure, they don't. What they do is they look at the top altitude, they set it in the altitude box, and they take off, and they go to that altitude. So if you're not familiar with Teterboro and you don't fly there often, real quick on a briefing, if you don't do a briefing full and complete, they look at that bold box that says 2,000 feet, they pop it in the box, they depart, and they go right to 2,000, and they nail a Newark arrival at, at, by 500 feet. Happened every time. So me and my friend brainstormed a little bit and we said, how can we fix this easily? Uh, so what they came up with was the Wentz One departure, which is now active in addition to the Rudy, but we're not using the Rudy. It's going to be decommissioned by July of next year, I think, while they test the Rudy, uh, the Wentz One. The Wentz One changed the top altitude to 1,500 feet. So now all the pilots, whether they do a full briefing or a quick briefing, they see that bold altitude that says 1,500 feet, they cleaned up some other stuff on the SID to make it more simple. And guess what? Since we've activated it about a month ago, we've had zero rasher warnings and zero people bust the altitude on that SID. So I'm really proud of that because I worked with a friend of mine and, and QC quality control to figure out how the heck can we make a difference here? Because uh, there were times where it was so bad, it would cause an RA, which is uh, a TCAS alert, for the airliner landing Newark, he would have to climb. That creates an immediate unstable approach. And that guy that has 200 passengers or 400 passengers has to go around. And believe me, he wasn't happy. So that is how we uh, addressed it. And so far it's working. So there's the answer to that. <laughs> Sorry if it was too long. No, it sounds like it, it was a positive outcome there. Um, I think we got through most of them. Uh, the good thing, I guess, even if we didn't answer all your questions is, is like we did last time, we will go through every single question that was asked and uh, give you an answer and we'll make those available. So if we didn't get to it, um, we will uh, not ignore you. Um, it's uh, almost eight o'clock. So I think we're gonna move to the next uh, portion of our program, which is the raffle. I think uh, 
Yep. So Jay, so we have 37 people that have entered in to win our raffle prize. So to make this completely random, all we have to do is Jay, you pick a number between one and 37. Oh, I have the power. The pressure is uh, on you. Pressure's on me. How about uh lucky 21? Lucky 21 is Jody Smith. So Jody Smith is the winner of a gift card and a pals cooler. Awesome. Congratulations, Jody. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Uh, so basically, this is the end of our program. I really appreciate everybody who uh, participated and got on. Really appreciate our guests. Uh, really great to hear from you, all of you. And uh, we, we appreciate what, everything you do for us. We can't do it without you. Um, and hopefully, uh, the information that we learned today will help uh, make everyone's uh, job easier and uh, uh, more enjoyable and improve safety if that's an issue. Um, so what we're going to do now is we are going to go into breakout rooms. There should be a pop-up uh, that comes up for you to decide which breakout room you want to go into. If you don't see the pop-up, go to the three dots, uh, the click more, and that should give you options uh, as well. And uh, some may uh, be very uh, spirited discussions and take a while. We're going to pretty much limit or sh uh, shut everything down at 8.30 and we'll be a, like a five-minute warning. So if you do get uh, that far into it, just to respect everybody's time uh, and... Uh, um, you know, hopefully we'll be able to get all the questions in. And if you didn't get a question answered, that'd be another opportunity for you to uh, ask it within that group. And actually you can switch between breakout groups if you had a question for more than one of the groups and they should be the Boston, the New York. And then I think we're uh, uh, combining uh, Potomac and IAD and I don't remember um, what we're doing in Atlanta. But anyway, so that's what we're doing now. And uh, again, thank you everyone for your time and participation, and uh, we look forward to the next one.